All right. Welcome, everyone, to our lecture series. We are Type Electives, and this series is about designing with criticality and love, where we invite new and established voices to share with us their stories, knowledge, and ideas with the community. And this, for this round in the spring, we're inviting artists and designers to share with us how they approach the practice from a place of criticality and love. Uh, as I mentioned, we are Type Electives. We are an online school with the goals of shaping the future of type. Uh, co-founded by Lin Yun and, and myself, and we try to offer courses that go beyond traditional type design education, uh, which include uh, letter forms, uh, lettering, creative technology, and we try to work with faculty that are made up of people who approach their practice from a place of respect, responsibility, criticality, and love, hence the title of this series. Um, and we're also excited to work with students who are interested in working with those principles. And I want to talk about our upcoming events. Uh, next week, we have the last online lecture of this series, uh, brought to us by Jen Ramirez. He's an amazing sign painter, designer, type designer, also community leader. Uh, and he'll be telling us more about his work. And we have two in-person events coming up. The first one is on April 14th at the Principal's GI Coffee House. Uh, it's going to be about death metal lettering. It's going to be really badass. So we hope, if you're in New York City, hope you can make it. Um, and our next upcoming event after that is on a Wednesday, uh, we're partnering with Wix Playground to put in a panel discussion with uh, Beatrice Lozano, Trey Seals, and Kelly Anderson, uh, all wonderful people who also approach their work from a place of criticality and, and love for the craft and the community. So these are our three events. We'll be sharing more in our newsletter. Uh, and if you want to keep an eye out for us, please subscribe. And with that, I'll pass the mic to Lynn. All right, we are super, super pumped to have David uh, talk about his uh, type and letter journey with us today. David is an associate professor of art and graphic design at Austin Peay State University and is currently pursuing an MFA in graphic design with a focus on letter form and typography at Yale School of Art. He is also principal of realistic design a design consultancy that is active locally and nationally. He is a designer and lettering artist who explores the relationship of type place with images of people and how this can sometimes be loving, at other times aggressive, etc. He will also share his process of exploring these relationships. And without further ado, I will pass off the mic to David. Thank you, uh, Type Electives, um, Juan and Lynn, for having me. And uh, it's great to see so many of you all out in this space. Uh, so I will get my screen going. All right, can you guys see that? Yes. All right. Yes. Um, so I guess my talk today is about kind of what's going on and and why we should kind of be straightforward about how we move about our environments and spaces. So I'll start out with giving a, a little bit of history on me. Um, there are some slides that are like slightly offensive based on like age of, of <laughs> resource, um, but it's all relevant to what we're talking about. So again, we're talking about uh, typography and criticality and love. And so to start out, um, these, this is me circa 1984 um, and my family. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, my dad was a professor. My mom um, is a retired uh, school administrator. Um, of course, that's me, future me, um, graphic designer. And then my, my younger sister is currently a vice president of a university um, in Tennessee. So of course, I'm an 80s baby. And that means a lot as far as like, how we establish our aesthetic choices and, and how, how we kind of see the world. Um, so in, in the eighties, like Nashville is really big. Um, this is a, a family trip we took to um, Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral um, outside of Daytona Beach, Florida. Um, and then I've always been in very, very diverse settings. Um, doing arts related things, um, children's choir or diversity workshops. And as you can see, like in this sixth grade picture, um, drug awareness was at the height of, of what um, 
what was being talked about. I think there are, yeah, three people in this picture that have on um, a dare shirt, one person with the Air Jordan shirt, um, and and Nathan with a Vanderbilt, well, two people with Vanderbilt shirts on. Um, and so at this time, I'm starting to like see patterns and clothes and see things like kind of people being used as billboards. Um, we had one TV in our house growing up, uh, which meant it went off around 8 p.m. Um, let's see if this after the Cosby show went off. Um, and so around this time, I was also looking at, you know, the typographic choices that were happening on air and, um, and how the lockups of, of type uh, were happening. Also, Hanna-Barbera was, was big at the time. Um, this wonderful cast of, of illustrated stars that are now, I think the only ones that have really stuck around is Scooby-Doo um, and the rest are just in the archives. And then around the time I really recognized heroes, He-Man was my guy <laughs> and I collected these toys. But I, when I started digging around, I didn't really realize how um, influential the type would be, you know, in, in what I would do in my future. So of course, like this type is very emotive and strong and bold and 3D and three-dimensional and has gradients and all kinds of fun stuff uh, mixed in. Then you've got Superman with the activated, uh, the activated arch in, the, in, the, in his type. Um, and just so, so, much, so much fun as far as um, like what I was taking in. Hot Wheels, another big one. This is something I would get uh, cars from my grandparents around Christmas or birthdays. Um, and then we have Viewmasters, like thinking about technology. So <laughs> Viewmaster, of course, there's the logo there. And then they always had like this very, very fine type on each of the, the, the carousels that would load into this piece. Um, and my first computer uh, we had at school was the Apple IIe. And the Oregon Trail was one of the fun games that we got to play on and learn from. And then thinking about type as I saw it then, um, as well as Odell Lake and, and the bitmapped um, typography that was very prevalent on those machines. Um, and then my mom being a dietitian and being in the school, um, administrative services for like food service and dietetics would have to create banners and, and things. And she would ask me to help her lay these things out. Strangely enough, um, I had a lot of fun with this and ended up printing my own banners. I have none of those anymore. Um, but this part is really crazy to me that you could just choose no font. Like what, <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> Um, and this is the time where discs were floppy and really pliable. And they came out on these roll printers. You know, so if you just happen to make a mistake and tear at the wrong place, you had to reprint the whole, the whole banner all over again. It was a nightmare. Um, and then thinking about um, the Trapper Keeper being a one of the... Um, things that we took to school, like love these things. It was a, a wonderful logo that, that has stuck uh, in the back of my mind. Uh, my grandmother was a quilter. And so I grew up um, knowing how to cut patterns or learning how to cut patterns and piece together colors and shapes and, and things of that nature. In the seventh grade, I um, had a project, a world geography project where I quilted um, the continent of Africa which was pretty cool. Um, and then my dad was a, a lyric tenor and a music professor. And so these are posters and things that we would see around the house um, and looking at the typography and the relationship to image. Um, image forward with type on top or image and type kind of equally placed. Um, this piece here, uh, typography and, and artwork by Aaron Douglas. And then of course, my mom being a, a dietitian, we always saw like the, the nutrition guides and the food guide pyramids 
around as far as like infographics and the way image and type would um, would be laid out. So I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. In Nashville, uh, Fisk University is a historically black uh, college and university, and and it holds the work of Aaron Douglas, and who's a Harlem Renaissance painter um, that that created book covers for like W.E.B. Du Bois and the NAACP and, and others. Uh, but these are pieces that are uh, inside that Fisk uh, Cravath Hall administrative building. And so there is actually a mural at the Harlem um, YMCA that has, that is one of his works. It's in a kid's room and it's, it's not well taken care of, but it's still up if, you, if anybody in the area wants to see it. Um, so these things are just gorgeous. And so looking at them as far as like colors and, and silhouettes and treatments for depth um, and scale are just brilliant. And then thinking conceptually about, you know, how he's illustrating um, figure. And of course, like the minimal color palette it's creating such depth and vibrancy uh, to be so graphic. Um, also, uh, my, my parents had us listening to things on the radio. So James Dobson and Focus on the Family and Adventures in Odyssey. And so we would get like magazines that advertise these radio shows. And I would take notice of how the type um, would interact uh, with image here as well. Um, but Nashville, Tennessee is, is in uh, the southern part of North America, um, or at least the southern part of the United States. And it's not as graphic as an urban area like New York or New Jersey or Philadelphia. Like you don't, you don't see like tagging of walls. They're really, really big about um, like they've passed anti-graffiti bills and all sorts of things of that nature. But um, growing up, we always like going to school or other places within the community to see these hand painted signs when we would like go to church or go to school or go to activities. Um, and these were just businesses that couldn't afford like the, the latest like vinyl treatments or the backlit signs or channel signs or other, other ways to create signage, but they would just pay, they would either create their own lettering or they would pay um, for somebody in the neighborhood to just create what they wanted. And so this um, last whole sports bar is on the famous uh, Jefferson Street in Nashville. As Nashville is gentrifying, these buildings are being torn down and the signage is like going away. This aesthetic of, of um, the hand or the aesthetic of, of a journeyman or a, or a self-taught uh, sign painter is really going away. This is JB's Barbershop, which is not too far from the last whole sports bar. Um, Mary's Old Fashioned Barbecue Pit. I don't know why they left off the ED. Um, and some of these images I took from um, Google Images because I wasn't able to go home to get them, but there's like faint <laughs> parts that are just disappearing. Um, and it's just kind of cool to see the experimentation between, you know, the, the lettering styles. And then there's a second here, which I'm not sure if this is vinyl because it, it feels like it's not painted. It's too uh, similar top and bottom. Um, then the Jefferson Street um, bookstore, also sports bar. <clears throat> And I'm starting to notice, just thinking back and researching like what I've been looking at is the mixing of typographic styles, whether they're script or um, sans serif um, or yeah, slab sans serifs and or bolds or lights, light typefaces. Um, man, I mean, just really gorgeous stuff. Like <laughs> you just get to see the grit and the character, you know, of, of these neighborhoods and the people that were there. Um, and then really to see the contrast, right, around it. You've got signage by the city. You've got a 
um, backlit channel letters across the street. You got this printed printed sign on vinyl, which has a number that's been replaced on top of the name of the business and it's two telephone numbers. <laughs> so it's like really, really great. Um, this one is great as well. And really like to see the to see the presence of the hand and the inconsistency of the eye, right? Just um, spacing issues, like because we're working in digital environments now, we can just correct it on the fly and our eyes are just trained to see it immediately. Like the weight of the N is like so much lighter than the rest of these things. Um, Bud's Curb uh, Incorporated. It's Fish and Pizza House. This is a, a pretty famous uh, place. Um, known for whiting fish and not catfish. Um, and it's pretty cool that they decided to, it's colloquially known as Ed's Fish and nobody ever goes there for pizza. And to think that they outlined it in gold as to be like the hype man for who they really are. <laughs> it's just so beautiful. Um, and then this, this part is hand done, but this part is not because it's it's a neon piece on top of it, but it's it's kind of close. It's kind of close. Then you've got like the tire shops that have their own type of vernacular, just like every Robin Hood's tires is like a different set of letters. And it's just amazing to think about the communicative value in that, right? Like in the in in this particular neighborhood, maximalism is is king. Like if if it's only like one line of type, something is wrong. That place is not reputable. It's it 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 may turn you away at the door, or it's not really welcoming to you. Um, but yes, like this thing is just just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and then you've got the markets. Um, where of course this whoever did this piece um, had to be pretty skilled, like they they worked and set up a grid um, so that things aren't like bouncing and dancing around. They used a, had to use a similar brush the entire time, and there is a, a clear um, clear hierarchy. Um, again, looking at brush brush scripts and and script and then the pairing of a sans serif and then same here so this sam's market is across the street from um that titan deli place it's just really awesome to see grocery shortened to grok um so this one was seems to be spray painted and not hand painted you can kind of tell because the lines are not as straight as you would get with a brush. Um, this is the barbershop that I went to as a kid, Miles Barbershop, and this gorgeous script um, that follows the line of this, this rose. It's pretty, pretty awesome to see this original sign, and then you've got uh, Cooper Black in the glass. And then you've got, um, last but not least, this Nashville Barber and Style Academy, um, which is pretty cool. It's got some structure to it and it definitely shows um, the hand and you can see spacing issues and things of that nature as well. So that takes me to Nashville as it currently sits um, and where we kind of currently sit in society. So, Nashville is a place where kids aren't vilified for um, having lemonade stands or, or being uh, persecuted for, for free commerce to raise money for issues. But it's also a place uh, where recently there was a school shooting um, where three kids, nine years old, all in the same grade and a, and a few administrators, um, 60 and 61, were all killed. Um, and it's been wrought um, 
you know, with, with these issues over time. So this same place, uh, which is for everyone, right? Um, is just known for good old Americana. Like recently it's been really, really gentrified in the sense that the home prices have gone up tremendously. Like I think since 2000, this is 2023, since 2018, I think home prices are up like 60%. So it's really, really hot. And people are coming from all over the place. But at one point, uh, this is what it looked like and felt like. This is a, a Gordon Parks um, image, not from Tennessee, but from uh, Chicago in, in um, 1956. Um, the sit-ins um, began in the civil rights, civil rights era began in Nashville in 1960 uh, with the sit-ins. And so it's wrought with this history that's really um, kind of spoken over or seemingly overcome, but digging into the archives and being within communities of color, these things, the history and the images still persist. They haven't been painted over or, or um, taken off the wall, you know, so that folks don't kind of forget the heritage of where we were and kind of where we are now. But looking back at these images, you know, I'm seeing things in these photographs, like um, type that's, that's moving or type on posters that is um, definitely different styles within the same composition. Um, let's see. And then looking at protest posters. Now, of course, like all of these things are within libraries and some are on the walls of, um, of history programs in town that are like cataloging like um, what the South was, what Nashville was, what the climate was at that time. And, you know, at the same time, I'm thinking about like how people have been accustomed to being communicated to and how they've been communicating to the world. And so it's pretty amazing to see like these signs that have been done by some commercial printers, others, um, on their own. This is a, um, a march on one of the first marches on Washington uh, before King's speech. And you can see all of these hand, hand done signs um, where folks have just created their own signs, not a union printer printing these things, no one disseminating these, these uh, signs out. Everybody is using their voice um, individually to build a collective. Um, to battle oppression and oppressive uh, laws at the time. Um, so these, of course, were printed by a shop and you can see um, the composition, the composition and the play uh, between uh, these, these uh, typographic treatments. Um, the now being um, a, a brush uh, typeface and this looks like Futura, um, a condensed version versus an um, expanded version or normal version. Um, this is a environmental um, protest poster uh, to, to save whales uh, from the 1960s. And again, you're seeing like uh, bold sans serifs in the mix um, of a script and then a brush um, and of course, uh, union, union printed signage. And more than likely this was, uh, these were letterpress. You can just kind of see like the spacing between them is inconsistent. Um, and then these are uh, signs that were uh, hand, hand drawn by Lo Loyola students. Um, in the 19, later 1960s, early 70s against um, Lyndon B. Johnson uh, for the Vietnam War. And so again, thinking about like the emotive qualities of these, of these pieces, like why go from, you know, like rounded, rounded letter forms to then adding serifs uh, to these. 
right? Like these are all design choices. And then filling them in um, really haphazardly with a brush, like really showing either the rush uh, to create these pieces or the fact that, you know, they're alluding to uh, war through the, the color and the overlap of the lines and such. Um, here's a, a poster against um, Jim Crow laws. And then thinking about this, like what, what at this time um, created, what at this time produced in this woman's mind or whoever created this poster, um, the point to create an outline for one and then create an outline with the feel for the other, as far as an emotive quality that this, that this poster uh, can exude. So then, right, digging, going from here, thinking like, well, how did you, like, what devices are you thinking about and how? Um, looking at the Library of Congress, there are, uh, there's a collection of like minstrel sheet music and minstrel posters. And they all have this very illustrated, um, multi-leveled, uh, multi-layered approach to type. Uh, to give it a sense of depth in this two-dimensional plane. Um, and they all like mix uh, typographic styles to highlight things or to make make uh, some type recessive or, or seem more supportive of the, the main goal. And so you've got like um, outlines and fills and then additional fills. Um, or additional outlines, and then just different typographic styles, really, um, we would say expressive, but in this particular offensive one, it's, it's meant to um, signify, you know, Asian culture. Um, this one, cursive on a really, really aggressive slant, of course, but it's got like a, a a bold outline, a very thin outline to create depth and distance between these figures. And then you've got, um, you know, others which just have a, a bold outline on a solid color. And others that are just as expressive but doing something else. You've got the D on a slant and runaways going up. Um, and then, this is, a, is, is an example, you know, of how I could look at a poster and then roll into like emulating those typographic styles to express, um, you know, my own take on what I'm thinking at the time. Uh, so this one is cold morning starts. I think I got up for a jog and it was a lot colder than I wanted <laughs> and a lot colder than I was uh, prepared for. So I ended up having to add some layers, but I wanted to acknowledge that time. Um, but also in the South, uh, hand painted signage on buildings is the thing. And instead of like pressure washing these things off, they just um, allow them to fade as time passes. Um, so this one is a down a hotel downtown Memphis, Tennessee, where I went to graduate school at the University of Memphis. Um, here's another one, W. M. William H. Harris and Company. I always wondered, like, how do you abbreviate William with just those two letters? Like, L's are consonants too. <laughs> so it was always great. Um, but really to see, like, the deterioration of, of these pieces. And then you need a biscuits. And then of course, like they're talking about furniture at the top of this piece. This is in Clarksville, Tennessee, um, where, where my um, institution, Austin P. State uh, resides. Um, and then another one in, in Memphis, Babes Hot Dogs. And you can see the combination of, of typographic styles within this large uh, canvas. Um, so in 2020, um, like post post uh, lockdown, I reached out to Mary Kate McDevitt, 
um, who's a well-known literary in Simone Wilder um, of Simon and Moose uh, to see if they would go on this hand lettering challenge with me. And they agreed. And it was supposed to be a 15 day um, challenge, which we, which we all did. And this was my first foray into like hand lettering. And this, what do you miss challenge was the first um, hand lettering piece. So I had, a, I had a brand new iPad, it was in the box and I unwrapped it. And I thought to myself, now that I don't have to drive 45 minutes to work, I can just start to create and attempt to litter on this thing. So I downloaded Procreate and this was the first piece I created. Um, and these were the 15 things that I missed about life at that time, not being able to hug my mom or go get a haircut. I missed um, seeing people in person. I missed seeing my students. I missed wearing bow ties to work, um, going to meetings and having cigars. Uh, Cinco de Mayo was the first like group activity that was kind of cut. <laughs> um, getting together with friends at the time, like Fauci and Trump and all, all of the folks were saying like really contrasting things. So truthful leaders. I miss driving my car. Um, we didn't get to go out for Mother's Day. I miss going out to eat with the friends and family. Um, wearing good shoes. I got accustomed to just wearing my running shoes to go out on my job or um, really slides around the house. Um, and last but not least, these last two going out on mask or boarding big planes, like when the semester would end, I would take a trip abroad or take the kids on a trip abroad to see something different. Um, so shortly after that, my George Floyd uh, was killed. And I was asked, I get, let me go back. I was, I was creating these things and I was posting them to Instagram and wasn't really thinking much about it. One of the challenges that I was having was that I was not showing any work on my website. And I still, aren't, I still am not showing work on my website. So I was never updating it, but I just wanted to sort of come out of this person that, um, that can show their work versus just telling other my other design friends and designers about my work. And so in this way, I was bravely putting these low stakes pieces of work out into the world that people can, could consume and additionally like have conversation about. So after that, like shortly after that, George Floyd is killed and I was asked by um, Finax, which is a nonprofit based out of uh, Bulgaria to to produce a poster uh, for them to give away for free um, for protest all, all over the world. And so I produced a poster, sent it out. Um, it was about normal, no more black death. I was one of 12 um, artists to produce, to produce these and people could download them and print them themselves or uh, Finex sent uh, printed posters around to various locations where they were having rallies and we're handing these out. Um, and so once that challenge ended and I got asked by Finex to produce this poster, I just didn't stop. I just kept producing more and more posters and became, I guess, productively neurotic. Like neurosis is not necessarily known as a positive thing. Um, but in this way, I became really, really focused and it became a daily uh, lettering task. And so my process is as follows. I'll think about uh, something that's happening in, in, in real life or in conversation. And I'll either go read or find quotes that make sense or I'll take notes on um, a newscast or take notes on conversations that I'm being had um, that are being had and just jot down the words first and then illustrate until I find a voice or at least the text itself finds a voice that can emote exactly what I'm thinking about. Um, so you can kind of see um, the combination of, of letter forms script, um, bold sans serifs, 
kind of mixed and having this conversation of attentiveness, like who comes first or what comes first, uh, what's 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 um, whispering or what's yelling or or what's mo most important. And so this one, this piece in particular, is like a, a collaboration with my my then two year old son. Um, he scribbled the background <laughs> and I lettered over it, which is kind of great. Um, and so most of my works are generated from life conversation and the news in response to that. And the reason I'm, I took that long route to kind of show like these protest posters is because they are, are real live and real time responses to what's happening at the time. Um, so I, again, was lettering daily um, based on things that were happening. So like in Portland, um, mothers were protesting, um, I guess, voting rights and some other things, and they were being tear gassed by the authorities and police there. Um, Kamala Harris was being um, questioned as far as being a citizen. Um, fight for the soul of the nation is is about um, voting and kind of where the country was going to go in the midst of like the last uh, presidential election cycle. Um, no soft shoe allowed in the meaning like you need to be bold in the way that you move about these spaces. Um, America be heard this time you know, again being about voting. And then I was asked by uh, the Biden, by design, the design team, uh, to produce a poster for an online exhibition. Um, I never would have, in my wildest imagination, thought that my work would be next to Paula Shares or um, in the same exhibition as Debbie Millman. Um, but, you know, you take one step and you just keep taking small steps and they land you in weird places. Um, so these were. Um, graphics around the election stuff. Um, if you claim to be uh, the least racist, you are actually racist is, is a response to Trump saying he was the least racist person in the room uh, during a presidential debate, which was kind of great. Um, this $600 blessing um, is about the stimulus <laughs> money that the checks that were being sent out to Americans. Um, by Congress that we're like championing it, championing it as like a, a savior uh, during the COVID, <laughs> the COVID pandemic and amidst the layoffs. Um, and then the no customer refunds uh, for election results is just a, a tongue in cheek um, nod to the lemonade stand and, you know, <laughs> wanting to recall the election. Um, so then I'm like things kind of die down and I'm I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe I should just lean in a bit more into like other pieces and not so political and, and wondering like what it would feel like to to litter um, a lot of words that aren't necessarily um, so politicized. And so I leaned in for uh, Mental Health Awareness Month um, and created a small series around this and wanted to see um, how the letters could emote and how I can make them emote in a way that um, could be fun and playful and maybe take your mind off of maybe a sadder or, or a somber occasion. Um, and then I started a series, um, this is actually Women's History Month now, um, based on uh, quotes by women of color. And so I really leaned in in, in this series to figuring out my hands and, and what script feels like and, and how a uh, script works. And so playing with more formal scripts or more playful scripts, um, adjusting contrast and in, in, in creating movement. And then again, like the juxtaposition of, of the lettering and uh, type styles so that they can communicate and embody like the spirit of these people and kind of what they were doing at the time and who they were in society at the time.
Let's see if this one will start. So this is a time lapse video. Um, I don't know why it's going so slow. So there's historic uh, pride in black activism. Um, this is a lettering piece that is meant to mimic kind of the ghost signage, right? Like it, it has a nod to the lettering styles at the time, um, outlines, um, inlines, uh, script, a brush, a brush feel, um, and movement in a way that, like if I printed this, it literally could sit on a sign you know, in 1945, um, or be done by a hand painter, a hand, a hand lettered uh, sign painter at that time. But again, like literally using this iPad to illustrate letters, um, drawing letters, not really writing, attempting to give them as much emotion um, as I can. And so then here are you know, some of them all together in a grid and just giving a, a, a look at kind of how these things kind of play as I'm evolving in my, um, my journey with using my hands to create letters. I'm, I'm now starting to use brushes and use lettering pens and use brush pens uh, to, create, to create works. Um, again, I'm ready to witness more history. <laughs> um, and this one again is a nod to uh, sign sign painting or or um, sign painting outside. And then thinking about the construction of type and how letters can can lock up and still be read pretty effectively. And this is a lot of type uh, within this composition, type styles within this composition. And then uh, attempting to um, experiment with additional typographic styles and how it can emote in the use of color. And with that being said, I would really, really champion you all to stay the course for whatever uh, typographic journey you're on. If you're, if you're learning, if you're curious, if you're an expert, um, to really just have fun and mine your past for for inspiration. So thanks. Amazing. Thank you so, so much, David. This is so impressive. I mean, I was impressed before the talk, but now I am way more impressed <laughs> after the talk. And I think like staying the course for you, I, I just, there's so much of staying the course. It's so impressive. It's seeing like where you started and where you are and where you've been and like just like the incredible commitment to staying the course is uh, just deeply astounding. And I know you have like a running practice as well where you are. How many days has it been? <laughs> I think today, today is 1077 days running at least a mile per day in a row. And this month of I'm averaging two and a half miles a day. Wow. Do, yeah. Doing something for like 10 days in a row seems like a huge feat, let alone like a thousand plus. So <laughs> amazing. Um, we have uh, questions in the, uh, we have questions in the chat uh, and I would love to ask you these questions. And if anyone in the audience wants to ask more questions, please put them in the Q&A function or if you can't find it, just drop them in the chat and we will find it for you. Um, our first question is from Raven. Thanks so much for sharing these awesome ghost signs. Do you have any insights on how urban, urban planning codes and policies with historical preservation impact the styles and locations and the business of sign painting? How it impacts the business of sign painting today or then? I mean, I'm sure then it had a lot to do with what typographically was put on the wall and I think the, the way people are going about preserving those now is cataloging them through photographs. And if the building is old enough and 
people care enough, then they can register it for like the historical, a local historical or national uh, historical uh, register in order to keep those intact so that those things actually don't come down or, or get destroyed. But like the smaller businesses and um, stuff in Nashville where you can kind of see the paint peeling off, those are being like bought up like every week or every month to make room for like new developments and, and such, it's, it's quite sad. For sure. Raven has another question. Um, okay. Thank you for sharing your progress and inspirations behind lettering pieces related to news and protests. In your view, what's the difference between instilling messages and narratives in a typeface versus a lettering piece? Hmm. Okay, so a, <laughs> a typeface is is a beautiful set of letters that are meant to work as a system. And you can type those out on your computer and you can just wield them however you need. And it's not the same as you you drawing a letter out with a brush. And um with typefaces no one knows how fast you typed it out, right? So there's not an intensity for which it was created. Like signatures and the, the fact that people don't like handwrite letters anymore um, is, is, you know, I, I like the ephemera of like handwritten letters and, and notes because I can see if like somebody was rushed when they wrote it or if they were sleepy when they wrote it or if they were, or if they're older when they wrote it or younger. Um, so like my, my four-year-old's handwriting right now, like says it all, like about where he is in life and what he's doing, what he's thinking about, like his hands are kind of telling on him, uh, versus my, you know, my 99 year old grandmother that, that'll write me a, a check for my birthday. I'm 41. I think last year she wrote me a check for $40 and looking at how she signed this check. And it's like, wow, like I saw my grandmother's handwriting devolve. And the difference between typography and, and lettering is so wide, like you don't have the opportunity to, like you can, you can imbue a typeface with love and you can put characteristics within that typeface in, in order for it to emote, but to show the characteristics of the body through the movement of the letters and, and what you wanted to say is wildly different. Like um, thinking about protest posters, like people use what what's nearest and what's fast. So thinking about if you've got a paintbrush and that's what you paint with, then you may take one stroke to create the first um, the first vertical four letter, which is one feeling. Now, if you double down or triple down and and make sure that it's like filled in, then that means you had time to make it. Like it's not something that it, it doesn't have the same immediacy that it would if you just need a sign like right now, like you're not just going to take your time and make sure that things are like cornered at the right way and they bend and curve in the right way. Um, and so that's the main difference to me, like as far as what what you're producing and why you're producing and the difference between letter lettering and then typographic uh, letter form design. That's a great answer. <laughs> there's there's a lot to chat about, you know, the expediency and just like the impact that both of them have and in, in ways through which we can view narratives into them. Um, there is a question by Maria. Uh, I think both of them are very related. So I'm going to try to combine them. Um, okay. So she's, she's talking, she's asking about process. Uh, is it like, how do you do your process? You shared a little bit about it, but she's asking, is it, do you start analog and then go digital or is it a combination? Um, and to top that, uh, follow up that question is like, how do you then decide how the letter should look like on the piece? Since you have so many iterations, uh, do you research a lot, or is it just part of part of it is research? Part of it is also your instincts. Uh, how do you how do you put it all together? Well, it depends. If I'm at a lecture and I write something down, then and I decide to letter on a notebook, then I'll letter that quickly. I could take a snapshot of it or not. Most times I don't take a snapshot. I just 
like eyeball this thing and then I like recreate it on the tablet. Um, and then depending on what what it is I'm trying to convey, like does it need to does it need to feel old? Does it need to feel contemporary? If it needs to feel contemporary, what um, I can either look at at typefaces that are similar to the contemporary uh, mode that I'm attempting to create. Um, or I can just go by the way I feel, right? Like if it needs to be on a curve or it needs to generate movement, or if I want it to feel older in the sense of um, giving contrast on certain sides of a piece, then I'll do that. So it really, it really, really just depends on the mood. It depends on what it is I'm attempting to say. And then sometimes I think about audience, but the majority of the time I'm my audience and I'm just attempting to have conversations with others about like what, my, what I'm thinking uh, through, through these pieces. Very well put. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Maria, for the question. Thank you for answering, David. Uh, are there any other questions? Please put them in the chat. Um, I, I I have a question myself because uh, you know everything you've said so far in terms of like looking at a typeface, like in a picture, or quickly scribbling things down, talks about a kind of mastery that I would probably compare to maybe like jazz musicians, where they mix shape, texture, layout, boldness, complexity, all of that. And you are like kind of like picking and choosing what's going to work best based on obviously your skill and your experience with all of this. So my question is like, how do you know when you're like done? Like, because you keep iterating, iterating, and you could obviously continue jamming, but how do you how do you find a, like a stopping point where like this is good time to time to let it go or time to publish? Um, yeah. Well, the first I mean the first um, stab at this was it had to be done in a day. So I couldn't take the lettering piece beyond 24 hours. And so wherever it stopped in my exploration is kind of where it stopped. The um, newer pieces though, have gone like longer than a day. And it's just because I haven't had time to just sit with them and, and just literally iterate through. But there's so many different, um, different, <clears throat> versions like if i did a time lapse of and a lot of these are time lapsed on my instagram profile but if you if you can see those you'll see all the different iterations before i find one that feels like i want it to feel like it almost it it, it, it reminds me of like molding clay it's like you get the pot going and then somehow your fingerprint goes in you're like ah and then you have to smash it down and build it back up. He's like, and so all of these different iterations, like they may start on paper and then they'll go to the tablet. And because the tablet is like split second fast and um, instant, like you can erase or you can create a, a second version of it or just duplicate it, erase apart. And then you can see in real time how those things work. So it does. Um, it translates over pretty easily. Like if I, most of these I've never like taken into Illustrator to like perfect. And so I didn't really talk mu much about texture here. Um, but the thing, like I use, I think the 6B pencil, the standard 6B pencil brush and Procreate in order to give it this grid and texture that feels like it's it's been, um, I don't know, drawn on a sidewalk or drawn on a brick wall or drawn on sandpaper or some textured surface that lends this heritage and, and grit to it that almost feels warm versus a flat, um, a flat solid color um, lettered piece that, that doesn't give that same emanation of, of heritage and voice and, and, and heart. Amazing. Thank you so much, David. Since we're almost at the top of the hour, I want to, oh, wait, there's one last question that came through. All right. So we will swap out the last question with Colin's question. Um, and maybe I'll just kind of sneakily sneak in my question too. <laughs> um, Colin says, I'd love to hear more about your process documenting type in your hometown through photography. 
do you have an interest in preserving type through your work? And my sneak in question was like, do you have any secret sauce behind keeping at it, like staying the course? Because you're so good at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, OK, so um, I guess first what first part of the question is about documenting type. And so I take pictures randomly of, of things that I find fascinating or, or lettering styles I've never tried before. So if it's something that I come across on Instagram, screenshot. If it's something out in the wild, um, a signage or a ghost sign or or a tag on the sidewalk, taking a picture. And so I've got like a lot of images um, of type on my phone. I've got a lot of saved images of type um, in the Instagram collections. I've got printed pieces that I've picked up and just like put in drawers um, that I can revisit just for like typographic effect or see what like moves and things that they made um so yeah I mean I, I preserve it like there's no rhyme or reason it's it's really my aesthetic choice or something that I feel like I've not tried and I want to see like what it feels like to incorporate that into a piece and so what you're saying like across all of these pieces is me like like sampling and sampling and sampling and seeing like what I can learn and um and what I can kind of train my eye on, right? Because you can, all of these things, like I'm looking at the color and contrast and I'm, I'm thinking about like making sure the consistency of the weight between the letters is correct. And it's just made me more aware, keenly aware of like, of, of tracking and kerning to make sure that, um, I mean, because lettering is like wildly different from, from type design, like kerning has to be set in the system. And you can do all kinds of strange things uh, with lettering. Um, but as far as like taking, having a, an account in an archive of, of, of works, yeah, I mean, if I'm in a community, I'm going to start taking photos in those places. I mean, we go, we just got back from Paris and I was taking photos of like, of stuff there. <laughs> so any any place like type is type is communicating to us whether we want whether we want to recognize it or not and um it's easy to see the big stuff it's easy to overlook the small stuff that that's on our phones or on our credit cards and that kind of thing but uh to your question lynn about like consistency there really is a um there really is a process like if, if you say you're gonna do something for 21 days, it kind of becomes a habit. And so like for my running thing, a pal of mine suggested we go, we do a 30 day uh, running challenge. And on day 31, my feet found my shoes and I was outside and <laughs> it was just it. And then after the 15 days for this um, lettering thing with Simone and uh, Mary Kate, it was the same motion. I just thought, well, wow, I, 7 p.m., the kids are winding down. I've got time to spend. Let me, like, letter something pretty quickly. And I just kept pulling the string. So I could see, you know, I could see where it, where it could go. <laughs> I'm convinced it's a superpower you have. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're so accomplished and you continue to accomplish all of these things at, like every day it's like the daily occurrence of all of these it, I, it's a superpower not everyone can do it but we have heard from uh the best <laughs> so i will try to take in a little bit of that and i hope you all in the audience is able to take a little bit of that we have all heard all the tips the 6d pencil uh keeping the course uh, documenting all the things that you find. Um, it's very, so very, very inspiring. Thank you so much, David, uh, oh, for being for here and me. being our honored speaker. Yeah, I appreciate it. My mom always says, uh, back to the consistency thing, big shots are little shots they kept shooting. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. That's, I feel like we need that as like a little mantra quote, like on the wall. That's right. Yeah. Amazing. Great. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for tuning in, being here, being present with us.
and uh, you know, we're all fans. So thank you so much, David. We are going to be looking forward to all the amazing things that you continue to do, staying the course as well. Uh, thank you, and I look forward to seeing you guys soon. All right. All right. Awesome. All right. Have a good Bye, one, everyone. everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.